Well, we are going to continue in our series, uh, Our Witness to a Watching World. And uh, I hope maybe this week you had an opportunity to share your faith. I had probably more comments last week through text, through email, through conversation than I've had in months concerning the message last week. Many of you said, my toes were stepped on, but they needed to be jumped on. Several of you said, okay, pastor, I agree with you. I'm just not sure how to do it. Some of you said, I don't know what my first step should be. So just hang on for the ride. We're going to get there. I promise you we're going to be sharing some things about how to share your faith, how to... um, Look at opportunities, you know, as opportunities. Sometimes we have an opportunity staring us in the face, and at the moment we don't realize it's an opportunity that God is giving us to, man, sometimes just go full bore ahead in, into sharing your faith. And it's like, if we're not looking for it, you're not going to see it, number one. And number two, if you don't care, you're not going to look for it. Um, but the, but the reality is the opportunities are all around us to share our faith and to present the gospel to those that we come in contact with. You know, so just by way of review, last week we were challenged to do just that, to share the gospel, to share our faith uh, with frequency and urgency. And I think sometimes those are two factors that we totally do not think about. Frequency. Um, I shared the story of how one of the churches that looked at me as a candidate for themselves as their uh, next pastor 14, 15 years ago. Um, When I went around the room of 12 people on the pulpit committee, only two of them could ever share a story of how they had ever led anyone to the Lord. Two out of 12 on a pulpit committee. And the two that did were in their 70s, and the story they shared was their kids when they were little. So figure out how many years that had been, 50, 60 years. And honestly, one of the most tragic things for all of us folks, I'm just being honest, is that we can live our whole life as adults saying that we've been impacted by Jesus Christ and yet we don't share that with anyone else. And the reality is, and we don't like to say it, but if we don't take those opportunities, there's a strong potential that those that we don't open our mouth to may go where? To hell. We don't even like saying it, do we? That's not a fun word to say. But it's the reality of a life without Christ. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And so we need to understand that we, not only just with frequency, but with urgency, need to look for those opportunities. And and this is where I've said before, and you're going to hear it again throughout this conversation, is that Andy Stanley says most of us live with a certain amount of measurable guilt as believers. You say, well, we don't have to have guilt as believers. No, we we shouldn't have to, and we don't need to, but we do because we know there are things that we should do, but we also know we're not going to do it. We feel bad about it, but not bad enough to change. And so we deal with a little bit of guilt because we're not willing to change. And the other thing that he said that I agree with, he says, if you ain't got the guts to share your faith, at least get them here so I can share it. Seriously. I asked the question, how many of you have friends, relatives, co-workers, neighbors that don't know Jesus? All of us. Why don't we say anything? Are you concerned that they may go to hell? Or would you love to see them in your forever family and in, in eternity in heaven? That'd be a blessing, right? And so we're challenged to, that there are people all around us. And, and we said there are, definitely there are those who have the gift of evangelism in their heart, in their mind, in their in their being. That's who God has gifted you. You've never met a stranger. And you could talk to anybody off the street, whether you've known them. And, and even if you didn't know them, you felt like you could, you know, you've know, you known them for years after you have a simple conversation with them. I, I can kind of tend to be in that category sometimes. I can sit there in person in line. And my kids laugh at me because nine times out of ten, if I'm at Wegmans and somebody's got an interesting name on their, bad, bad, on their name tag, I'm going to ask them where they're from. Dad, quit asking them that. I usually like to guess in my mind, and half the time I'm right because I've visited eight countries of Africa, and I can figure out what some of those names are, but they don't mind talking. Did you know that? How many have a natural 
fear of talking to people who have earrings all over their head and tattoos all over their body? How many of you have a natural fear? Raise your hand. Be honest. Right? I have found that people that have tattoos all over their head and piercings all over their head like to tell you about them. I went up to this one, and I, I, went to this, I said, man, that had to have hurt putting a tattoo on your eyelid. He goes, actually, he goes, it was kind of numb. I didn't feel anything. And he went on and told me his life story. People who have tattoos all over their body, they don't mind talking about them. They're not ashamed of them. They like to talk about them. But they're, they must be rebellious. They must be that person. Folks, we need to get over the stereotypes. A lot of times, people just need a, a word of encouragement. They need a little bit of love. You know, sometimes people want to talk, but if you, they have that certain look or that certain aura about them, we just kind of stay away, hands off. Why? Because they're not just like us? And here's the thing. If we're having this conversation about our witness to a watching world, right? The reality is we live in a world where people are hurting. I could ask a question this morning. How many of you are going through hurts that no one else knows about? Most of you, if you are honest with yourself and you're truly being honest, you're going through some things that hardly anyone else knows about. And you supposedly have God to help you through it. Who does the world have? I find that people need a word of encouragement. People need to have a conversation once in a while and say, hey, they're not against me. They're for me doesn't mean I agree with everything they're doing. There are things that go on in this world I definitely don't agree with, and I'm not going to condone it. But it doesn't mean I can't show them a picture of God's love. Because people are hurting all around. How many know that? People are hurting. And we're afraid to talk to them because they got a tattoo on their face. Or I, I went to this one. He had a chain from his ear to, his, to, to the inside of his lip to his nose. Do, do, do. And uh, so I, I asked this couple, they both had it, this boy and girl. And they went on to tell me how when they went to kiss one day, the chains got locked. They couldn't get apart. Talk about a funny story. Have a conversation. You never know what kind of laughter you're going to get out of it. But once again, Evangelism is not necessarily a giftedness thing. It's an obedience thing. And so don't say, well, it's not my gift. Evangelism is not my gift, so therefore I'm out. You're not out. There's no, no justifiable excuse when you stand before God one day, well, well, God, you understand this wasn't my gift. Right. Your excuse, no worries. That's not going to happen. So what is the way forward? How can I take steps to implement sharing the gospel? Well, this way, this week we're going to talk about getting back to the basics, the way forward, getting back to the basics. When famed NFL coach Vince Lombardi stood before his team, he said, this is a football. Uh, these are all professional football players after all, yet this really did not deter Coach Lombardi from seeking to remind them of the basics. And in doing so, he took them back to the fundamentals of the game. As a result, he also took them forward into years of championship playing down the road. How many know that Vince Lombardi is one of the best football coaches that ever lived? Red Arbach did something similar. He said, this is a basketball. It's round, it's comprised of rubber on the inside, then it's covered with leather, and he said then you inflate it with air, and when you bounce it, and you throw it towards the ground, it comes back up to you. And they're like, duh. He says, we need to get back to the basics. And I think sometimes, as I reminded all of us last week, is that we need to get back to where we started. I've said for years that God saves some people out of some things. He saves some people from some things. What do I mean by that? 
I've heard stories of how God has just utterly changed lives. Maybe he's helped them out of the throes of alcoholism and allowed them to become sober again, or drugs, or pornography, or various other addictions. And somehow, God was able to bring them to a place of victory in their lives through a relationship with Him. Well, I got saved as a young child. The only bottle I knew was a baby bottle. The only bars I knew were the crib bars, <laughs> as someone said. I was never in adultery. I wasn't in addictions. I was, I was a kid. God saved me from some things. But here's the miracle. He saves us. Right? Saves some people from some things, and he saves some people out of some things, but he saves us. But when he does that, he does a transforming work in our lives that forever changes our path, our destiny, our purpose, right? See, apart from Jesus Christ, we're all bound for where? Hell. But with Jesus Christ in a relationship with Him, we're now destined for where? We have heaven as our hope. And no matter what we go through in this life, we know that it is only temporary. Because whether you live for 100 years or 5 years, it's still just a speck on the timeline of eternity. We have something greater to look forward to. And all the struggles and the disappointments and the hurts and the frustrations of this life are only still temporary, no matter how long you live here. We have something greater to live forward to. But if we forget the awe and the wonder of what Jesus Christ has done, through, done for us through salvation, what is it that we're here for? Isn't the very purposes that Jesus Christ had in coming to this earth, should, shouldn't that not be part of what our purposes are? Um, this is not on my list of verses here but this morning, but John three sixteen through 17 he says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Think about that phrase right there. Condemn. When we look down on the world that we live in, and when we look down as, well, they're just a bunch of idiots. They're just a bunch of freaks. They're just a bunch of this. They're a bunch of that. They're liberal. They're woke. Trust me, I've, I've been a part of all of them. I'm guilty. I really am. About as guilty as all of us. I have opinions. I have strong opinions. In fact, as I get older in life, I don't so much care about my house. I don't so much care about my car. I don't so much care about my clothes. The one thing I'm unwilling to relinquish is my opinion. I can lose muscle mass and I ain't going to care if I relinquish my opinions. I might not be able to hike and do this and that, but I'm not giving up my opinions. They're mine. and You can't change them. I have opinions. They're strong. But if Jesus did not condemn the world, why? Because he said that's who they are. I don't have unrealistic expectations for the world that I live in. My expectation of the world is not greater than they should be because I, tr I expect that from them. I expect that the world around me is going to be woke. I expect the world around me is going to believe in abortion. I expect the world around me to love this liberalism and to think that socialism and communism is not a bad thing. I expect that from them. Right? Are we, are we shocked at that? No. But if we live in a world where we have to constantly fight for, well, you know, I just got, I, I'm a lone ranger. No, you're not a lone ranger. Trust me, you're not. Jesus Christ did not come into the world, condemn the world, but that the world through him, what? Might be saved. So, in other words, as he was in the world, but not of the world, he was doing what? Looking for opportunities to point those around him to his heavenly Father. Right? How many would agree? Raise your hand. If that was the purpose of Jesus, should that not also be our purpose? Absolutely should be. But we need to be reminded of what took place in our own lives. We need to get back to the basics of our very own salvation story. What is it that God wants to do in and through our lives? And I feel it's necessary every, every year, year and a half, to get back to one of these types of messages where we start thinking about what did God do for us. So let me ask you, what's your story? Take 10 seconds right now where you're at, sitting in the chair right now. What is your story? 
How did you come to know Jesus? I didn't say come to know about Jesus. I want to know how you came to know Jesus. You see, there's a lot of us that know about a lot of things that, without really knowing that. I know about Joe Biden from everything the, the news tells me, but I don't know him. I can't pick up the phone and call him. I can't send him a text, giving him a piece of my mind. I can't send him an email. It's not going to get there. If I send him a letter, chances are he's never going to read it. I don't know him. I know about him. And fill in the blank with any, any of your favorite people that you like to read about. I'm amazed that when Princess Diana passed, I mean the millions of people who flooded the, the roads and, and, and the flowers and the gifts, and the, they didn't even know her. They knew about her. See, we know a lot about a lot of things. We know a lot about a lot of people without really knowing them. So my question is, when did you come to know Jesus? Like you know your kids. Like you know what your fa kids' favorite food is. Or when they're, let me see, I'm going to get some of you in trouble. Or when their birthday is. I can still rattle off my kids' birthdays. I don't know how much longer, but I can still do it. I know what my kids like. I know that no matter how fancy schmazzy a restaurant it is, I don't care how, do how expensive that restaurant is, I know Jake's going to get chicken fingers. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Am I right? Every time a kid's going to go for chicken fingers. doesn't matter if they have prime rib, he's going for chicken fingers. You know, I, I know what my kids like. I know that Andrea does not like shrimp. She does not like seafood. Shame on her. I, I, I know my kids. Why? Because I've spent time with them. I've had conversations with them. I, I know what they like, what they dislike. I know what irritates them too, by the way. Why? Because there's no shortcut for time. You want to have impact on somebody. You want to have an investment in somebody's life. You have to what? Spend time with them. So Jesus was in the world, though he was not of the world. But, but if we think back to our story, if you've had a story, what is it? What is your story? Can you look back at a time in your life where you realize these several things? First of all, that you're a sinner. You say, well, is that really important? Yes, it is. You have to understand where you're at. Romans 3.23 says what? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're going to talk about that word glory at the end. But we fall short. God's Word says we are born in trespasses and sins. In other words, there's a line that we weren't supposed to cross that we were born on the other side of that line. We were born on the wrong side. We were born on the side of sin. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. And because that one man, because of those choices of one, every generation, every person, past, present, future, will be sinners. The bloodline has been corrupted. We are sinners. We were sinners can you look back to a time in your life where you realize that you were a sinner? Number two, can you look back to a time in your life where you could do nothing in and of yourself to take care of this sin? You can't take care of it. I can't take care of it. I can't wash myself clean when it comes to these issues of sin in my own life. My goodness, my flesh is way too strong and my spirit is not strong enough sometimes. Where one's good, three's better. I'm just telling you, in almost every aspect of their life, whether it's food or dollars, one of the good three is better. And the ability to control things is difficult. Some of us are pretty disciplined in some areas, and some of us are undisciplined in areas. But when it comes to this idea of taking care of your own sin, you can't. You can't be good enough. God's Word reminds us that all of our righteousness is as what? Filthy rags. We're reminded in the Old Testament, God says, all your righteousness are as filthy rags. And he says in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You think you're righteous? You think you're holy? You think you're good? You think you're without sin? Eh, sorry. God says, all your righteousness are as filthy rags. I didn't say it. God's word says it. And because of it, I cannot save myself. 
If you ever look back to a time in your life, and I'm just, I want you to think about your story if you have one. If you don't, if you can't answer these questions, there's a good chance you don't have a story. You say that is a bad thing? It's a good and a bad thing. It's a good thing because you realize that you can start a story. But it's a bad thing because if you don't start it, you, you know where your destination is. But you need to repent of that sin. You realize that in Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. There's only one man who went to the cross of Calvary. One person. He alone was the, had the ability to pay the price because he was the perfect lamb without spot or blemish. He took on the debt that he did not owe because we had a debt we could not pay, as someone once said. These are the basics of our story. This is where the, the foundation comes into play. And you can't save yourself. Ephesians 2.8.9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3.5, Not by works of righteousness which I have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. We cannot save ourselves. Have you looked back at your story and say, well, I, I made a lot of changes in my life. I mean, I, I used to be a mean person. I'm not mean anymore. I, I really try my best to be a nice person to everybody I come in contact with. Being nice is not going to save you. It can't save you. Then it would be on your righteousness and your works, apart from what God already did through His Son Jesus on the cross. Being good will not save you. You say, well, I, I, I'm no, I, I don't do the thing. I don't steal anymore, and I don't lie and cheat. Good for you. That's a good thing, but it's not going to save you. And if you can't look back at a time in your life where you repented of your sin and accept what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross, you don't have a story. Can you look back to a time where you realize that you needed to trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross to pay the price for your sin? Look at John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Then verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way. There is a million self-help books in the libraries across America. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, there is a self-help book on, for every subject under the sun and probably hundreds of them, if not thousands. I mean, if there, if there, you figure whatever area you need self-help in, there's a book for it. I read an article yesterday about, uh, I forget the terminology, I will say it wrong, so I'm not going to try it. This one particular woman in New York City got tired of people asking her when she was going to get married. And so she went and had a ceremony where she married herself. And when they asked her why she did it, she goes, because I want everyone to know that I'm important. That I matter to myself. I thought, what is the epitome of selfishness? The epitome of pride and arrogance. The epitome of actually, she gathered a crowd around her. She walked down the aisle, so to speak, with flowers in her hand, laid them on a table in front of her, and she began to say vows to herself. This literally just happened. Crazy. Who thinks of this stuff? Somebody's got way too much time on their hand. I, I don't know. But this is the world we live in. You can do nothing to save yourself. There has to come a point where we realize that our faith is in Jesus. Acts 16.31 reminds us of that. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. It comes through believing. And then can you remember a time in your life that you prayed and put your faith and trust in Him alone for salvation? I've said this many times over the years. And I can't emphasize it enough. And I want, this is the basics. We're coming back to the basics this morning. So if you have a story, you need to remember this as part of your story, if indeed you have one. And it's this. Well, I just believe. Okay, that's not enough. Well, well pastors. No, no, no. 
The devils believe. Is that enough for them? Are, are, will there be devils in heaven? Will his demons be in heaven? It's a little weak, is it? Thank you, Bill. Um, I, I don't think there's going to be any demons in heaven. How many agree? Say amen. amen. Okay, so, but they believe. So what's the difference? If the devils believe and they're not going to be there, what, what, what difference does it make that I, that I believe? What, what would be any different from them and me if, if we both believe? I'm glad you ask. Romans 10.9 says this, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. What, what, what does He add to believe? What? Say it again. Confess. So confessing has the idea, it presupposes that you're going to what? Speak. You're going to say something. I confess. God, I, I, I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I, I can't shed my own blood to cover the price of that, that sin. I, 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 I can't do it. So there's where he brings in the whole idea of not just believing, but to confess. And, and, and by the way, we're going to get to this too, but not be ashamed about it. So let me ask this question again. Has there been a time in your life that you can look back to when you started your story, so to speak, if that's when you, if you have a story to have started, where you said, Lord, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. <coughs> Excuse me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that, God, I, I can't save myself, and therefore I ask you to forgive me of my sins and cleanse my heart. And I call on you, Father, to save me. I put my faith and trust in you alone. And you literally pray that prayer. If you've never done that, you don't have a story. You don't. But if you have, you have to ask yourself what you're doing with it. See, not everybody that goes to church is going to heaven. I wish that were the case, but it's not reality. It's just not. Everyone has this idea, well, I'm a good person. I go to church. I help the poor. And those are all things that you are doing to earn merit and a good standing before Jesus, and it's not going to get you any closer to him. Even his disciples said, well, Lord, haven't I even cast out demons in your name? Haven't I not done miracles? Haven't I not done good? And he says, depart from me, for I never knew you. See, there's a difference between knowing about versus knowing someone personally. So he says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He says, is it important to pray? Yes, it's important to pray. Not just believe. I could say this. It's as concrete as, you know, I'm going to take my next breath, see? I took it. I believe that. That's how concrete our walk with Jesus can be and our salvation. Because he says, these things have I written on you who believe that you may what? Know that you have eternal life. He says, how does it happen though? By believing and confessing with my mouth. So before I even go any further in the message this morning, I got one more point I'm going to make. But I'd like for us to bow our head and close our eyes. We're not going to have a, Paul, you don't need to come up or anything, but let's just take a moment. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and I'm in a moment I'm going to bring my second point, but I want to ask this question. Do you have a story? Do you truly know Jesus? Can you look back and honestly say, Pastor, I remember this time. Well, I don't remember every single detail. I don't know what date it was. I don't know what day of the week it was. I don't know. I don't, may not even know what year it was. But I remember a specific time when I acknowledged that I was a sinner and that I couldn't forgive myself of my own sins. I, I, I was lost. But I came to the realization I needed to confess my sins and I asked Jesus to forgive me and cleanse my heart. And I put my faith. Maybe you have that. That's wonderful. But maybe you're here and you say, I don't remember that time. 
I don't remember a time where I actually prayed. And I acknowledged that I was a sinner, that Christ died for my sins, and I asked him to forgive me. But Pastor, he goes, I'm, Pastor, I'm concerned about that. Can I simply ask those of you that are concerned this morning? If you cannot remember a time, what would hinder you from saying, I want this to be my time? What would stop you from truly knowing Jesus and having a story to begin right now with this chapter of saying, I put my faith and trust in Jesus? Can I challenge you that are here this morning and you say, I'm not sure about that story. I, I, I can't look back and I can't remember that time. Can I simply encourage you to pray this simple prayer? My prayer will not save you. It cannot save you. It can't. But if you say, Pastor, I want to pray. I'm just not sure what to say. I can lead you in that prayer. It's a simple prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. Just repeat these words. In faith, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you shed your blood that I might have forgiveness. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse my heart. And I put my faith and trust in you alone for salvation. I'm willing to pray, Father, and ask you to save me. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, you say, Pastor, I, I don't remember a time where I prayed that prayer, but I prayed that prayer this now. Would you would you simply acknowledge that? Anyone like that? Just look up at me just so I can see your face. Make sure I catch your eye. Anyone like that this morning? Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate your honesty. You have a story now that's so awesome. You know for sure. Lord, thank you for these who've lifted their, their heads, Lord, who've acknowledged that they prayed that prayer. They've removed all doubt. They now know a time where they acknowledged you as their Savior and that they could not save themselves. God, give them strength. Give them boldness to share their story with others now. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, once again, we need the importance of our story because we'll never give away what we haven't got. Remember, we've heard this before. So, if you have a story, what are you doing with it? Those of you that have a story, you can look back and say, I was... 9, or I was 21, or I was 17, or I was 34, or whatever it was. With your story, what are you doing with your story? Who gets to hear your story of how God worked in your life and brought you to a saving knowledge of himself? Well, let me give you several verses that are kind of all over the map a little bit, but just some things to consider when you consider your story. And we'll go through these rather quickly. Mark chapter 8, and verse 38. It says, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in an adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed of, and he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Question, are you ashamed to speak of what God has done for you in your life? Those are some pretty strong words. How many would agree? Raise your hand. You see, in the Bible, these are the red words. He says, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. We shouldn't be ashamed of what Jesus has done for us. We shouldn't be ashamed. Remember last week I read a quote. It says 52% of people said it's uh, you know, wrong to, to have a conversation if somebody believes something differently. Well, if that's the case, we might everyone believes something. We'd never open our mouth with anybody. Everybody believes something. But we ought to be bold in what we believe. Luke chapter 9 and verse 26. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. When Jesus Christ comes in his own glory, oh, wait a minute, you were ashamed of me and now you want me to take you with me? Eh. We have this idea that we can just kind of quietly, secretively have my faith in Jesus. Nobody has to know about it. It doesn't need to affect anyone else. It's a private thing, so therefore I'm okay. No, you're not. Because he says, don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of me. 2 Timothy 
This is a verse we grew up on. I grew up in Awana from the time I was, could, could barely walk. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. What? Rightly dividing the word of truth. We don't need to be ashamed. Study the word. Know what it says. Know what to believe. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 15. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and give light to all who are in the house. You know, he said, you're the light of the world. Remember last week we looked at that verse in Matthew. He says, you're the salt and the light of the world. You, in other words, you're, you're supposed to be effective. Salt is only good if you, what, use it. He says, if you, if you don't use it right, then it's good for nothing. But, to, you know, throw it out on the ice. Let it crack the ice a little bit, you know. You know, salt has a purpose, and it's to be effective. Light has a purpose, it's to be effective. And nobody lights a you know, candle and then puts a bushel over it so that we have no effect of it. There's no sense in having a light if you're going to cover it up. Put a bushel over it. Put a basket over it. Snuff it out. In other words, don't be ashamed to let your light shine. Romans 1.16, I love this verse. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to what? Salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's what we've just talked about for two years in the book of Acts. Don't be ashamed. It's the power of God unto salvation. 2 Timothy 1.8 Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner. But share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. He says, Paul says, wait, let's go back in history just a little bit. Just three or four weeks through the book of Acts. Did Paul go through some suffering? And what's he saying here? Share with me in those sufferings. What we would consider sufferings and what his sufferings were are probably diametrically opposed to each other. I've never been beaten. Never been whipped. Never been shipwrecked, believe it or not. I haven't gone through anything like Paul went through. But as soon as I open my mouth and someone disagrees with me, we get our feelings hurt. They, they just they got upset with me because they don't agree with me. That is not suffering. I'm, I'm just telling you, it's not. We like to think it is, and well, we like to become a martyr because someone disagreed with us. That's not being a martyr, trust me, it's not. <laughs> exactly. The reality is, we don't know what suffering is, but yet he invites us to share in the suffering. In other words, I think we need to realize that we have a boldness that God has given to us. Someone said, well, I need to pray for boldness. No, you really don't because you already have it. X, how do I know that? X18. That's not in the notes. X18 says, But ye shall receive power. Therefore, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, right? And ye shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He says, you've already been given power and boldness through the Holy Spirit. Why? Because what know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have God, and you're not your own? So when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, you now have the Holy Spirit living within you. No matter where you go, the Holy Spirit goes with you. That's what 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says. You're purchased. God owns you. He's not going to let you out of his sight. Anywhere you can go, he's with you. You have what it takes to do what God's called you to do. It says, but you shall receive power. Why? Through the Holy Spirit that indwells you. Second Timothy reminds us, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, sound mind. He says, I've given you what you need. So, in closing, let me give you one more thing. The example, I think, of one of my favorite examples of sharing faith in all of the Bible. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 4. I love this. And I'm going to speed read, as if opposed to any other time that I don't. Um, yeah, some of you know me. Uh, John 4. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though he himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. Let me ask a question. Why did he need to go there? Because he knew who was awaiting there. He knew what he had to say when he got there. He knew what he was gonna, how he needed to speak to this lady. But here's the idea. He went out of his way to, go some, to have an impact on somebody he knew needed to hear the gospel. 
are we willing to go out of our way to make ourselves available to share the gospel with somebody who needs to hear it? We said last week, a plan not to be intentional is a plan to fail. Because if you're not intentional about it, you're not going to do it. So he was intentional about sharing and pointing others to his heavenly father. Verse 5, so he came to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, that sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Those are those people with earrings, tattoos. They're marked up all over their bodies. They have weird clothes. They wear black, whatever. Not necessarily, I'm just being, being facetious, but you get the point. The people that we don't normally associate with. The people that we kind of avoid like the plague because they're different than us. The people that we don't really want to have a conversation with because, well, you know, I'm not sure where this is going to go and I'm kind of afraid of them. For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Half-breeds. That's what they were looked upon as. These are the people that we would not go out of the way to reach. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, who it, who it is who says to you, Give me drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Do you understand what Jesus Christ just did here? Let me, if you didn't catch it, let me just pull it out for a second. He found a common need with a woman he came in contact with. What was the common need? Water. You know, there are people that you have things in common with all around you that will allow you to have a conversation with them. I mean, it can be so simple as the weather. It can be so simple as the food you eat. So simple as the car you drive. I mean, we all drive a car, right? <laughs> Who hasn't had a conversation about your car? We all have things in common with everyone around us. He simply found something that was in common, water. You want to have an opportunity to have a conversation? Find something to have in common. Find something to highlight in that other person. Find something to ask them a question about. Find something that will open a door to a conversation. It's not as hard as you think it is. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one whom you know now have is not your husband, in that you speak truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and the Jews say that, that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We now we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and they will worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Wow, can you imagine? Or just looking back, the two that were walking on the road with Jesus who are all down in the dumps because they crucified Jesus and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm him. I, can you imagine just for a moment the, the, the startling realization? And here's what he reminds. And the, at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Who were the disciples? Those that were realistically, theoretically, closest to who? Jesus. Who are the ones that should have known Jesus better than anyone? The disciples. And what's their opinion of Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman? 
guys, do you see what's going on here? Do you, why, why, why is Jesus talking to a Samaritan? He's Jewish. What, what in the world is going on here? Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. How dare he? They marveled. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? We jump to conclusions without asking questions. We're good at that, right? We think we know. We stereotype. We think we know all the life story without asking a question. That's what we're good at. We see somebody and we, th- we think we know their story. They got tattoos. They must be rebellious. They got 20 piercings. They must be rebellious. They work here. They must be this kind of person. We think by looking at someone we know their story, and we don't. Not to say that we're not right sometimes, but conversation is better to be had. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who could tell me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him, in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said, I have to food to eat which, of which you do not know. And therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? They're more worried about his, whether or not he's eating than what he's doing. And Jesus said, my, meat, or my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, I lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white unto harvest. And he who reaps wa- receives wages and gathers and fruit and et- for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which I have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. Let me jump down to verse 42. With this, I close. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this indeed, the Christ, the Savior of the world. Look at back at verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all things whatever I did. the most simple example of sharing our faith with someone else is to simply share with someone else what Jesus has done for you. You see, the verse I forgot to read in the center of all this text was that verse where it says that after she believed, she left her water pots and enrolled at Jerusalem Baptist Theological Seminary. Or the Samaritan Institute of the Bible. Or Israel Doctrinal Studies Program. Did anybody else read those verses? I don't see any hands. You mean she wasn't theologically trained? She didn't go to school first? She simply told her story. Now, does it say that everybody she came in contact with got saved? No. But what does it say in verse 39? Many of them did. You know what else I didn't read in this text? That she was supposed to somehow control the outcome. That's up to God. And the person, how they respond to it. I'm called to obedience. What do we all need to realize in order to be saved? That we've missed the mark. The whole idea behind missing the mark of the target is that we fall short of the glory of God. The whole idea behind the glory of God means that it's simply to glorify God means to put him on display. To put him on display. We fail to put God on display in this. That's what it means to bring glory to God, to put him on display. This may not be true of every one of us in this room, but how many of you have things that you like to display? I think actually it is true of most of you in this room. For many of you grandparents, you know what it is? Pictures. Grandkids. And you have them all over your house, and it just just so happens that when you have a conversation, oh, by the way, let me dig into my purse and grab the portfolio of pictures I have of all my grandkids. 
and tell you stories about them and how my grandkid is smarter than your grandkid. And you know, I, Just kidding. We put things on display that we want to, and that's what it means to glory, to put it on display. You know, for some of us, it's things. You know, I, I've got things that I think are pretty cool. I've got a couple of knives that came from my dad. And they're special to me because they're from my dad. I have a couple of things that my dad have given me that I think are pretty cool and because I, I like to put them up, you know, some pe- certain people come over that I know have an interest in those areas, I'll, I'll take them out and show them. Why? Because they're cool. They, are, they mean something. And because they do, I put it on display. We have the flag of Don's grandfather, Jacob Eli Trevathan, who our son Jacob is named after, and someday he'll probably have that flag in his house. It's, uh, I made a case for it, and it's on display. Jacob Eli Trevathan, only Jacob Eli Todd, the same initials named after her grandfather, a very godly man. It's on display. Why? Because he was a godly man. We fall short of the glory of God. We fall short and fail to put God on display. Do we realize the punishment of our sin, the wages earned for our sin is death, according to Romans 6.23. Because sin always demands a penalty. Sin always demands a penalty. Sin breaks the heart of God. Sin breaks fellowship with God. And we need to understand God's provision or cure for sin is that he died on the cross. He paid the price. I close with a statement. Some of you have had a story for up to 40 years or more. And yet you've never shared your story with someone else. I hope that changes. You have hope. Amen? You have heaven to look forward to. But not only that, you have Jesus to go with you each and every day of your life. He lives within you. You have hope. What greater commodity could we have than hope in Jesus? In a dark world that we live in. Share that hope. Put God on display. Bring glory to Him through this. I don't know about you, but share your story. There's a world watching us. What are they seeing? I hate to admit it, but man, too much of my life is lived in selfishness. And I just know for me, I can get so wrapped up doing all these things for other Christian people in my sphere of influence that if I don't intentionally go outside this Christian sphere, I won't do it. You have to be intentional about it. You say, well, Pastor, I don't get around very often. You get to where you want to go. We all do. You all have a neighbor. You all have a friend. You all have a coworker. You all have somebody that you can impart your story to. If you want to. Don't let it be another year past where you don't share the, the story that, you, that God has given you. Don't let another day pass without having an opportunity. Say, God, just give me an opportunity. If you pray for it, he'll do it. He'll do it. Lord, work in our hearts this morning. Lord, I pray that you would impress upon our hearts, Lord, a desire of urgency. So, Lord, we don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when you're going to come. We don't know when the, all this is going to end in this world. None of us has a guarantee of tomorrow because you said, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Nobody who gets in an accident and dies, nobody who has a heart attack and dies, nobody who develops a cancer and dies expects that today might be that day. Things happen all the time that we don't expect, that we don't plan for, and yet you allow them for whatever reason, for whatever purpose. So Lord, help us to make the most of today while we have it. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when you're going to come back. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be effective in sharing our story. Lord God, forgive us for not doing it. Lord, may we not make any more excuses. May we not try to justify why we don't do it because it's not our gift or what have you. Help us to realize it's not giftedness, it's obedience. 
And Lord, our church, this church, the church of Jesus Christ around the world, around the United States, we've got to get back to sharing our faith. We've got to get back to sharing the gospel. We've got to get back to, Lord, begging you to save souls while we still have the ability to do that. Thank you for working in our lives. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your patience and your forgiveness with us, Father. Thank you for the gift of salvation you've given to us, Lord. May we not abuse it. May we not take for granted your grace, Lord. But to be faithful and obedient to what you've called us to. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, simple opportunity to respond to what we've heard today. You say, Pastor, uh, I'm challenged that I need to share my story. This morning, I realize I've not been a good, doing a good job of this. God's convicted me. Say, pray for me. Anyone like that this morning? Pray for me. Yes. Yes. All around the auditorium. So the question is, what's going to be different when you leave? Can I challenge you to do three things? Number one, pray. Ask God for opportunities. Number two, make yourself available. And then number three, be intentional. If you don't do those three things, it won't happen. So don't just be challenged, be changed. Do something about it. We have hope. We have hope because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Let's share that hope with others. Lord, I pray you be with each one who raised their hand this morning. And I pray to your Father, Lord, that you give them opportunity. Give them availability. And I pray to your Father, Lord, that we would be intentional about it. All of us, Lord, myself included. Be for each one who raised their hand their heart towards you this morning, Lord, that we would not just be changed or challenged, but changed, Lord, as we go our separate ways. And we pray your blessing on this message and those who have responded to it, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.